Now the next speaker is Dr. Sayyid Farjad Sultan, who will be talking about Dutch Nidratami and, and total intervenous anesthesia. Uh, thank you very much. Uh, first of all, I'd like to thank the organizers for inviting me to talk on Dex methylatomidine. Uh, so, it's a relatively new drug. It was introduced first in 1999 and FDA approved for a use for procedural sedation and for uh, intensive care sedation. That's what the license says. Uh, it was introduced in the UK in October 2011 and in Pakistan by Brooks Pharmaceutical on Jul and it was available in July 2018. Uh, what is it? It's uh, a dextrorotatory S enantiomer of metatomidine, which is a veterinary uh, sedative agent. So, like a lot of our uh, anesthesia agents, few of them actually, not a lot, they were first used in animals and, you know, they said, oh, it works in animals, let's see if it works in the human beings. And so this is where it came from. It's very highly selective, alpha-2 uh, adrenergic receptor agonist. Uh, it has 1,620 1, times more affinity to alpha-2 as to alpha-1. It's very short-acting and it is labeled as an intravenous anesthetic agent. <clears throat> How does it act? It acts via a G-protein coupled uh, alpha-2 receptor on all three alpha-2 uh, receptor types and these can be found in the central, peripheral and autonomic nervous systems. Where does it act? It acts on the brain directly, on the spinal cord, on the autonomic nerves and it has other organs that it acts on to as well, such as the heart, muscles, and the intestines. So what does it do? It causes sedation. It causes anxiolysis. So it's one of those agents which are pretty good for relatively short procedures where you need to have the patient appropriately sedated and having no anxiety. So it causes anxiety at the level of the brain. Uh, it does cause a reduction in the heart rate. It may cause bradycardia. Uh, it has anti-shivering effects on the muscles. That's where the alpha-2 receptors in the muscle uh, start acting. It causes vasodilation in certain organs and does cause diuresis, and it causes vasoconstriction in other organs. So it actually inhibits vasoconstriction and it causes analgesia at the level of the spinal cord. How does it act in the brain? Well, it blocks the norepinephrine receptors at not one level, but different level, including the thalamus and the cortex. So, hence causing the uh, anxiety and sedation. It has a rapid distribution, six minutes, that's what it takes. And it has an elimination half-life of two hours. 94% is protein bound. It is metabolized in the liver. Uh, it has inactive metabolites, which is great. And these are excreted in the urine and feces. And even after prolonged infusions, there is no accumulation. And even if there is, we know there are inactive metabolites, so that's not much uh, variable. The pharmacokinetics is similar in young adults and elderly, so which is very helpful and makes it a very good agent for TIVA. The doses, well, Brooks Pharmaceutical, when they uh, were coming out with it, uh, we had a chat with them, and uh, what we suggested was you need to standardize the doses. It makes it easier and safer to use. So. Then I got a phone call from the guys saying, there's an app, please download it. There is a Brooks app and it's very, very helpful. It gives the adult and pediatric doses. So for those who are using it, uh, it does work. The, I won't go through the details of them, but the main point is that after all of this, recovery is within 10 to 12 minutes. So you turn it off, you can expect the patient to be up in less than 10 minutes. When do we use it? We have to be like all drugs, we have to be cautious of its use. Again, excretion by the kidneys, so patients with renal disease. Please be aware of these things. Hepatic disease, elderly patients. They do say that effects and pharmacokinetics do not change, but the dynamics may change. Pharmacodynamics may be different for elderly patients. One, mainly because it is highly protein bound. Elderly patients don't have, may not have as much protein, so the dose may, may need to be titrated. Uh, it should be used with caution in patients with uncontrolled diabetes. It does tend to get, uh, give them quite significant hypotension, and there is no data as yet on obstetric patients. So uh, we don't know whether it crosses 
the metronome heat or the barrier or not. So it's not recommended as yet in the obstetric patients. Well, not to use it. Well, in patients who have uncontrolled hypotension. Uh, one of my residents asked me, what is uncontrolled hypotension? Or in fact, what is controlled hypotension? Uh, hypotensive anesthesia, when we are causing the hypotension, uncontrolled hypotension would be something like gross septic shock or a shock state. So it should not be used and should be relatively avoided in uncontrolled hypotension. And you should be aware uh, in patients with second degree and third degree heart block, because it causes bradycardia, it may cause them to go into a complete heart block or even worse. And there is no uh, evidence in human beings of its use in acute cerebro cerebrovascular events, but from animal studies, uh, it is uh, suggested that you avoid its use. So how do we use it? Well, it, can, it is used for, as a sedative agent. It can be used as a sole anesthetic agent, so the TIVA aspect of it. It has analgesic properties, and it can be used as an adjuvant for modifying and having a, a multimodal analgesia technique. So it is used quite widely in ICU sedation. It is licensed specifically for ICU sedation. That's what it started from. And for procedural sedation, so which is where TIVA comes in. So the evidence, or actually the literature says, gives quite a lot about gynecological, urological burns patient, change of dressings. Uh, pediatric patients, uh, I'm not too sure whether it's licensed for use in pediatrics. They do use it in pediatrics. I have used it in pediatrics. Uh, abroad, but I'm not sure about the license for use. I I, I could not find it. If there is, please, I would, it is off-label use. So again, so please be aware of that. Uh, in obese patients specifically, if you want to do fiber optic intubation, it is a great drug for giving sedation and uh, anxiolysis. And, and in obstructive sleep apnea patient, it is quite helpful as well. As a TIVA agent, as a sole anesthetic agent, there are quite a lot of it. There is few literature of its use in carotid artery stenting in patients with COPD. And uh, in fiber optic intubation, there is quite a lot of literature, uh, especially with obese patients and difficult patients uh, with different uh, anatomical issues that, may, that will cause difficult areas. Uh, it has been used for avoid. Uh, it has been used for awake thyroidectomy. We don't want to use it. Uh, awake craniotomies. Uh, yes, we do use it for awake craniotomies, laryngoplasties, and surgeries for tracheomalacia. And uh, it's very for those who routinely use it. It's a very nice, clean drug uh, for monitored anesthesia care. Uh, it can be used as a baseline sedative for a variety of surgical procedures or short procedures, endoscopies, colonoscopies, all these short procedures, change of dressings, pediatric procedures, which require a bit of sedation. Uh, it gives better patient cooperation. It reduces the opioid requirement. And there is less depre respiratory depression as compared to midazolam and fentanyl. It can be used as a pre-medication as well for uh, patients coming in who are highly anxious as an intravenous agent. It can be given intramuscularly for burns patients specifically, and it just calms them down. And it is very effective for stress attenuation, and I have a slide on that. And it reduces the, uh, if you use it as a pre-medication, it, it has been known, it's documented to reduce the thiopentone dose. A single dose of one mic per kg uh, helps in, the, in stress attenuation. It is uh, it blunts the hemodynamic response with uh, laryngoscopy, and it reduces the opioid and anesthetic requirement throughout the case. So it's pretty, it's a pretty nice drug. A bolus dose of one mic per kg over ten minutes prior to administration of reversal will control the hemodynamic, will control the instability that uh, happens during extubation where the blood pressures are going all over the place, left, right, center, and you have a much smoother extubation. So it is quite, it would be quite nice to have, uh, to be used in patients where you need to have a controlled blood pressure throughout. It is used as an adjuvant in different techniques. Uh, small doses can be given for uh, total intravenous anesthesia, regional anesthesia. It is used in subarachnoid blocks and for uh, epidurals as well. 
it is used, uh, it has an effect on alpha 2 uh, receptors, so it can be used with uh, bupivacaine and it gives a better uh, sensory and a motor block and uh, gives sedation effect as well when you put it in peripheral nerve blocks as well. For non-anesthetic uses, uh, if you have patients who have opioid, and this is again touching a bit of uh, the critical care, I'm just moving a bit away from the TIVA, uh, opioid and benzodiazepine withdrawal patients, no, it causes ansiolysis. It's brilliant. For patients who have alcohol withdrawal, when they're going left, right, center, all over the place, start the infusion, give a bolus dose. It will calm them down. And in sleep-deprived patient, it is used as a sedative. And in patients who have shivering, postoperatively, uh, it is an anti-shivering agent as well because it has a direct effect on the muscles. So mainly, it has no respiratory depression. Sedation is like physiological sleep. So the patient does not have the side effects of uh, the other anesthetic agent that we use. It is of it is documented as beneficial in uh, pediatric procedures, short pediatric procedures. But again, it's a off license use. It has less hemodynamic side effect as compared to the other agents that we use. Uh, there is no risk of dependence, and more importantly, it does not have any rebound effects. Thank you very much. <laughs>